Hi, John. Thanks very much for joining us today. So much has changed since we last spoke just a month ago, with the biggest factor being the risk-off trade in the markets now. The S&P was down 8.8% in the month of April, the worst month since March of 2020. The NASDAQ was down over 13% in the month of April, the worst month since October of 2008, now down over 20% on the year. But uranium is staying strong. The Sprott Physical Uranium Trust is still up 20% on the year, give or take. It was up 40%, but it's also pulling back here with the global markets. But why don't we just start there, John, and just give us an update on the Sprott product. Where is the NAV? How many pounds do you currently have? And what's your cash position? Yeah, hey, thanks for having me back on. I mean, it's I can't believe it's early May, and uh, it's unbelievable how, how uh, active these markets have been. Uh, you know, if I reflect back on on what we've experienced so far in 22, we we started the year at, at about two billion dollars in net assets in the trust, and right now we're at three billion. So, as you mentioned, despite the pullback that we've seen in, in just about all commodities and all you know stock and bond markets around the world, we still are about plus a billion in in, in um, net asset value. So it's been it's been tremendous. The trust right now holds 55 and a half million pounds. Uh, and just to put that into perspective, uh, we started the trust last July with 18.1 million. So we've acquired a lot of material uh, so, so far in 2022. Our capital raising has obviously slowed down with, uh, with the general sell-off in the market. Uh, but we remain very optimistic because we don't think anything has changed with the general thesis. And so you just touched on the fact that you have not been very active in the market. Why is that? Well, the fund has, has been trading at a small discount to NAV for the last couple of weeks, so that's limited our ability to sell new units. We can't sell new units if they're not accretive to the prior day now. So we did have a little bit of cash in the fund, and we've been kind of picking away and buying some pounds as the market sold off, probably about four or 500,000 pounds of late. Um, so the fund has, has been a little bit more quieter, quieter than normal on the capital raising front, but you know we've talked to some of our largest shareholders in the last week or so, Everybody is remaining very confident in the thesis. If anything, I would say the thesis is getting stronger because last year what was really powering everything was this theme of our own energy transition, decarbonization of economies. And now you've got that with the twin pillar of energy security. And energy security uh, obviously is being uh, taught to us those lessons all over again like they were in 1973 when we had the oil crisis. But the war in Ukraine is really shaken the market up, particularly in Europe. The, the reliance on Russian coal, natural gas and oil and other commodities has really upset the whole supply chain there. And it really has put nuclear back on the, in, the, in the spotlight as being a, a more reliable, low carbon form of energy production. And I think that's uh, be, gonna become more and more apparent as energy policy shifts in the favor of nuclear. Hey John, why don't we spend a little bit of time on the spot market, given the weakness in the global markets and also many commodities. What are you and your team seeing in the spot market? Sure, so we started the year at $42 a pound and we got as high as around $63. That last $10 of gain from about 53 to 63, we can attribute that uh, uh, on the back of the threat of sanctions for Russian conversion and, and enriched uranium. So that threat of sanctions, we saw the price of uranium go from 53 to $63. Now, without these sanctions coming out, it seems as though the market is kind of discounting that probability and we're kind of back to $53 a pound, which, you know, when you compare it to where we started on Jan 1 at 42, is still a very healthy gain. And we think that the market is still going to be dealing with the the issues in Russia for a long time. We say that because even if the war were to stop tomorrow, we think that the nuclear fuel supply chain is gonna completely pivot away from Russia. Um, and that's gonna cause uh, the utilities to have to find alternative supplies and it's gonna to have to uh, create more capacity or prompt more capacity to, to be created in, in places like France, Canada, and the United States to, to meet that, that shortfall. Hey, John, given the turmoil we are seeing in the global markets, are you seeing a lot more supply? Are your is your trading desk getting a lot of calls from sellers looking to get off pounds? Yeah, 
Yeah, I would say it's been very quiet. Um, so we've had a price correction, but it wasn't really on the back of an oversupplied market. There's, you know, there's always material in the, available in the market. It comes and goes through different offtake agreements. But you know, this sell-off that we just saw in the uranium price was not driven by you know a big wave of selling of physical uranium. It was just basically pay people selling down uranium, the, the price of uranium, like they were for many other asset classes, whether it was gold. Uh, you know, different stocks and bonds. So uh, we're, we still think it's a tight market. And if the West wants to make up the shortfall uh, of, of Russian uranium supply, they're going to need more uranium. There's no doubt about it. And it's going to take time for that transition to happen because you just can't flick a switch and, and, and uh, replace those. But over the next 12 months or so, we think the Western conversion facilities are going to need a lot more raw materials to make up for the Russian material. The SEC recently declined the U.S. listing for SPOT. Can you just touch on this? What were the issues and what are your next steps? Sure, yeah. So it was disappointing for sure, but it's 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 not something we ever felt was 100% probable to happen. And the reason for that is because until you go through the process, you just never know what, what they're going to anchor on. And this was a novel listing, which means the SEC had never gone through a review of a physical uranium stockpiling fund. With these particular funds, there's a number of standard listing requirements, and we were specifically asking for exemption from two of them. And those two were related to having a redemption mechanism, and obviously our current uh, trust does not have one, and it would be very complicated to implement one, and we don't think it's in the best interest of investors over the long term. And the second point is more fundamental to the uranium market itself, which is offering an intraday indicative value. And what this is, is a calculation that uh, you can publicly get off a, of a screen that shows you what the value of the basket of the assets in the trust are, and it refreshes every 15 seconds. What that information gives investors is a point, a reference point relative to the market price, so they can see real time, how is the basket of the underlying assets trading relative to the bid and ask. So investors can can figure out, you know, is the fund trading rich, richly or kind of cheaply to its underlying asset. Unfortunately, in the uranium market, there is no widely available real-time price, spot price for uranium. We're just not there yet. We've made a lot of progress, you know, finally getting to daily pricing. But in terms of, you know, having a widely available real-time price, we're not there. And that structural element was something the SEC was concerned about because it creates information asymmetry. And that was something that they specifically said uh, they would like to see addressed in the future. So, you know, we're hopeful the uranium market will continue to evolve, it will become more active, it will become more liquid, but they're just not ready at the present given the current state. That's a great overview, thank you for that. So we spoke on the spot market, why don't we touch on the term market? What are you and your team seeing there? Yeah, well, I think it's fair to say that we're waiting to see Cameco's uh, next quarterly earnings because they really blew the uh, the doors off the hinges in mid-February when they when they announced to the world that uh, they had uh, contracted 40 million pounds. So we're we're waiting for that as a signal to see, okay, are the utilities continuing to 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 rebuild their contract book? They're obviously been scrambling around. Um, the price of conversion and EUP have really skyrocketed on the back of this Russian, the Russian sanctions. Um, and eventually the price of uranium is gonna follow suit because it's a key building block, obviously, as you move down the, the nuclear fuel supply chain. So we're gonna be looking for that news as well as any other, any other RFPs that utilities are putting out, looking for signals that utilities are, are becoming more concerned about the security supply and also who are they buying uranium from as they pivot away from, from Russian uh, sources. John, the other big news that has transpired since the last time we spoke is the completion of the North Shore Global product. It's now called the Sprott Uranium Miner GTF. And why don't you just touch on this product, tell us how many issuers are in the ETF and also what the AUM is. It may be the top three holdings. Sure. Yeah, we're very pleased to add this product to our suite. It took us a little bit of time to get the, the rec, uh, requisite shareholders to vote for the uh, reorganization, but on April 25th, uh, we reorganized the North Shore Fund into the to the new um, Sprott um, Uranium Miners ETF, and that's ticker URNM. And 
we like this product. Um, it's very well designed. It, it performed incredibly well last year. It was actually one of the top performing uh, ETFs last year. Um, and it's, it's a very simple product. It gives you broad exposure to a group of uranium producers, development companies, and exploration companies, as well as a small allocation to, to vehicles that, are, that hold physical uranium, including the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. So right now, the top holding is Gazatomprom with about 16%, Cameco is 15% right now, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust is around 10%, and then a whole bunch of developers uh, and exploration companies fill out the balance of the other 35 odd companies. So it's a nice, you know, one one uh, one ticket solution to get exposure to a broad range of companies. And in addition to trading in New York, it's also going to start trading in London and Frankfurt. Maybe you can give us an update on that. Sure. Yeah, we partnered with a company in London called Han ETF, uh, and they're essentially going to white label. Uh, URNM for us and, and offer it in a number of European markets. One of the things that we discovered as we went through the proxy process and, and marketing of SPUT was that there's a lot of interest in Europe in nuclear. I, I don't think we appreciate in North America how much of an energy crisis they're dealing with right now, not just because of the, the, the Russian sanctions and whatnot, but just generally uh, things have been very, very difficult energy markets there with the price of natural gas, increasing hundreds, hundreds of percent, price of oil, the price of coal, and renewables not being as reliable of late. So there's a lot of interest in Europe in terms of coming back to nuclear. We've seen a, a number of big policy announcements. The UK just announced they want to build eight more plants. We've seen Poland just announced they want to have uh, nuclear power plants for the very first time. France obviously is very committed there. Um, and so this narrative is starting to permeate through the European investor community. And then the last piece of the story is the EU finan uh, sustainable finance taxonomy. We do believe, uh, even though there's been a lot of foot dragging on this, we do believe in the end nuclear will be included in some way in that taxonomy. And that will give uh, an added leg up uh, to the sector, but it also will open the door for a lot of investors in Europe that are sensitive about ESG. Because right now, nuclear is not included in that taxonomy, and it, and it has a little bit of a, uh, an obstacle there. So once that gets implemented, we have, uh, we have spoken to European institutions that said that they're going to get involved in the sector when that happens. And John, as we wrap up, what can investors expect in terms of news flow out of Sprout Inc. in the coming weeks and months? Sure. Well, we're going to continue to do what's working which is get out, educate the market, and be very transparent with what we're doing with the way we run our funds. I think this has been really critical. Uh, we've really added a lot of disclosure and transparency daily to the uranium market, which historically has been incredibly opaque. So I think investors have responded to that. We're very interested in some of these ancillary themes to uranium and decarbonization. So we are working on other uh, ideas right now that, that we will like to bring up to the market in the coming months. And I, I think we're just still at the very early stages of all these commodity bull markets because uh, most people just don't realize that a lot of these commodities have been in 10 year bear markets. A lot of capacity was taken out of the system. And now that the world needs these commodities, they're learning very quickly. You just don't flick switches and, and, the, and things start flowing again. It takes many years to restart even a, a mine that's been put on care and maintenance. So, you know, when you think about all the greenfield development that has to happen to meet the future demands, uh, whether it's energy transition, electric vehicles, decarbonization strategies, I mean, I think it's a very exciting uh, time to be investing in these sectors. John, thank you very much. It's a great overview, a great update, and it's always insightful when I speak with you. Great. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.